Welcome, panelists. So today we're gonna to be talking about privacy. The name of this panel is Privacy Hype. And I have some very good guests on stage with me to cover that topic. So why don't we start off with some very brief introductions. Do you wanna start, Howard? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Howard. Um, I'm a managing partner at Decrypt Capital, um, also associated with uh, blockchain at Berkeley and uh, researcher at UC Berkeley. Hi, my name is Hasib. I'm a partner at Metastable Capital, and we invest into cryptocurrencies. Hi, my name is Karthik. Uh, I do investments at Polychain Capital, and we similarly invest in cryptocurrencies. I'm Alex Zidelson. I'm CEO of Beam, and we're building a scalable confidential cryptocurrency with opt-in auditability. Okay, to start off, in this panel, we're, we're going to be talking about privacy in the context of blockchain. Can we, get, can we start by talking a little bit about that relationship? What is the history of privacy and blockchain? What is the relationship between those two things? I'll jump in. So I think um, if we look back to the original uh, Bitcoin white paper, we were discussing uh, about this blockchain where you can have payments and the claim is that these are going to be anonymous payments on this network. And I think that that has always been uh, the guiding ethos of, of our space. Um, everyone is trying to achieve this type of vision. And um, as the, as the uh, ecosystem itself grew, we started to see uh, more and more generality in the actual uh, uh, blockchain architectures. So we're starting to see more functionality in these systems. And um, with that, uh, people are starting to realize that these aren't necessarily anonymous. And that's where uh, the introduction of things like uh, Monero and Zcash and and basically this first wave of private payments arose. Um, I think that that's always been a, a guiding force for us and we're now starting to see this general trend uh, towards a more, uh, more broader uh, use cases of, of private uh, compute. And uh, this industry itself is starting to uh, grow towards a more uh, modular and private ecosystem then. What was, what was the problem with like, so you know, it was supposed to be anonymous but it wasn't anonymous, why is that bad? Is there a problem with it being anonymous or non-anonymous? I don't think that there's a problem with it being non-anonymous. I think that the anonymity part of cryptocurrencies was mostly due to like the early sort of nature of the crypto or like Bitcoin ecosystem, which is full of like crypto anarchists. And so privacy was a very natural feature that was like desired. Um, but I think like today there's like we've kind of learned how like crypto is like used and like how it's adopted. And I think that certain currencies being like public and in the open is actually very good. So like Bitcoin being private would mean that it could not be KYC in exchanges and ultimately adopted by institutions. So like that part is actually very good. And I'm not sure if complete Monero S privacy is perfect for Bitcoin. Um, but at the same time, I think that privacy is also kind of the holy grail of value transfer because it's something that is cryptographically guaranteed and was not possible before. Um, so I think that there's also that sort of level of privacy that people are still trying to achieve. Um, but I think that there's also this like third sort of desire for privacy, which is more functional. So like institutions and ent enterprises who one day use um, like these blockchains um, will want to have certain features that you can use like the technologies that guarantee privacy for like you can use snarks to compress things down um, and you can use zero knowledge proofs to obfuscate for example if um, I don't know banks start to use um, uh, blockchains and obviously like they have their own enterprise constraints um, so I think that like privacy technologies have like kind of grown a lot since like what it used to like, what was kind of what it was like thought uh, for. So I have a question here, which is like, do blockchains need to be fully private? I think you're kind of talking about that. I feel like there's this um, kind of spectrum of where what blockchains are used for and privacy factors more in that. So I'd like to sort of explore that a little bit. Where is, um, like, are there blockchains that should be fully private? Are there blockchain, blockchains that should be partly? And what are their use cases? So uh, I think, uh, Everybody needs financial privacy. Every business, every individual needs financial privacy. So if we're talking about money on blockchain, it really needs to supply a certain level of privacy because otherwise, if all my transactions are visible, let's say as a business or even as an individual, 
it leads to a lot of issues, right? Say, if I'm a business and I'm doing my transactions on Bitcoin, then potentially my competitors could see how much am I selling for and who are my customers, and it brings in a lot of problems. A business cannot really use that in day-to-day -day life it's, if it's all visible, right? On the other hand, uh, full privacy like we have in Monero really prevents this currency to, from integration into the, into the financial system. So we need to find a combination where on one hand only uh, I decide, uh, I mean from one hand, on one hand that my transactions are not visible to anyone but I can still choose to show them to, to certain parties, my auditors, tax authorities or, or others of my choice. I think it's important to give users a choice on privacy. Um, if you want to send something, say, between you and I that you don't want other people to, to know about, it should indeed be private. But there are other things, for example, um, if you're trying to have an election and you want to know that you know, everybody had voted, but you don't necessarily want to you know, reveal what you voted, who you voted for, um, you should also have that degree of privacy uh, incorporated in that operation. And so uh, it really depends on the nature of the transaction. And uh, in this case, I think it's very valuable for users then to have a choice uh, on these architectures to choose how much privacy they want. And we're starting to see some uh, blockchains that provide these features where you can enable or disable private uh, transactions, but at the same time, there's also uh, a push towards, uh, towards uh, more private architectures as well. I think one of the difficulties here as well is kind of user education around privacy, because a lot of the users who are in the blockchain space don't actually understand the parameters around privacy that they have available and the privacy guarantees of different blockchains. Um, and actually, I think what would be interesting for us on the panel is to just get a read of the temperature in the room. How many people actually have an intuition for how Bitcoin is not private? Okay, so it, it's actually, it seems like about like a minority or about half and half? Yeah, okay, that's yeah. not about half. Yeah, so, so maybe an interesting thing for us to delve into is the ways in which Bitcoin is not private, because that might not be obvious to people who just sort of, you know, read the tin and think, oh, okay, Bitcoin is a private cryptocurrency. So that's a good segue. Why don't we do that? So okay. how, is, how is Bitcoin not private? Uh, well, so I, I think one place to start is that, uh, so the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin white paper originally described Bitcoin as an anonymous cryptocurrency. In reality, Bitcoin is pseudonymous. Um, and the difference there is subtle, but it's very important. So under a pseudonym, um, your behavior can still be tracked. People can still kind of follow a chain of payments that you're making. Um, and, you know, for the most part, when you're using something like, uh, uh, when, when you're using exchanges to like buy into a cryptocurrency and then make some trades and then go, you know, buy out, because of the fact that everybody can see all of the addresses from which you're, you're receiving payment and to which you're paying, um, any kind of motivated uh, person who's just paying close enough attention to this public blockchain uh, can actually de-anonymize you and figure out the trail of payments if they're sort of working hard enough. Now, this is not trivial to do, but there are, there are companies that exist in the cryptocurrency space like Chainalysis that literally, you know, they contract out to governments and what they do is they try to de-anonymize people through their cryptocurrency activities. This is basically that like transparency versus privacy problem. I've never actually understood how that works, though. What are they doing exactly to trace it? Because it's just an, an address. Well, so there's usually three levels of privacy that I like to look at. The first being protocol, the second network, and then the third applications. And each of those levels, you can basically go in, look at metadata, you can look at these transaction histories and try to derive more information about it. Um, in general, the, what these companies do on the protocol level is to say, does this protocol actually have a, a sufficient degree of uh, obfuscation uh, of the transaction at hand? And if it does, they, then they will look up to the next uh, layer, which is the network level. On the network level, if you run nodes, um, for example, there were some studies that were done in the early days from like uh, Dan Kaminsky, uh, where basically uh, the probability was extremely high that if you were to run multiple nodes and you see a transaction stream in, that the first IP, uh, to, that, or that the first uh, uh, node that you get the transaction from is very likely going to be the IP of the source, of the sender. Okay. And so this is a, a demonstration that basically you can start to aggregate these types of uh, network behaviors and then use that to basically go and, and find these users. If you're an ISP, uh, it's certainly a simple lookup uh, from, from your angle then. But uh, if you go one layer above on the application level, um, a lot of folks that are going to be shopping and buying things uh, with, for example, Bitcoin, will likely have an account with their uh, name, their email address, and whatnot. And this will then be linked with 
uh, their uh, actual Bitcoin addresses. And um, yeah. this is obviously very valuable information. If you think about traditional financial payments, um, credit card companies love to buy this information from vendors. And it's, uh, and, uh, it's something that's uh, very important, not only from a business perspective and analytics perspective, but even from an advertising perspective. And if you think about the nature of Bitcoin transactions, if I start to go to websites to buy this stuff, I don't have that same information from you know, the credit card companies anymore. And so where do you go? Well, you go and look at the blockchain. And so naturally, you start to derive things about people's spending behaviors, maybe their account balances, maybe what they like to buy, maybe you know, all, all of these details start to become available for people to, to look at. And it sounds like more, tr because it's, it's sort of started with this idea of being private, but it's like, it's all public. It's actually more uh, transparent, but also yeah. more public than you would have expected. Do you want to say something? Um, yeah, so I just actually wanted to touch on a point that Howard had. Um, I think that it's really, so I think uh, very frequently we talk about uh, blockchain privacy is only the transaction layer. Um, and to answer your question, like how this is done is that, you know, once you're KYC in an exchange, then you have an identity that's tied to your address. Um, but what's more interesting to me that, I, uh, that not many people actually think about is network layer privacy. So like how private is actually the machine that you're broadcasting your transaction on. Um, and there's actually a lot of great work being done here on, uh, to improve this part of blockchains, like the Dandelion Protocol, um, which uh, tries to obfuscate who's exactly broadcasting a transaction so that miners and, and transactors on the Bitcoin network are not directly, are not directly traceable. Um, and this, can, like, this has interesting implications um, depending on what your machine actually does. If you overlay a cryptocurrency on the Tor or ITP protocol um, for relaying like uh, an anonymous or private messages. What was the name of that project? Dandelion. Dandelion. Okay. We're actually implementing that as well and we're adding merging of transactions during the stem stage. So we're not just obfuscating the source but also merging multiple transactions while they're being uh, transmitted. So which should make this network level snooping even more difficult, uh, but it, but there is still a risk, you know, on, on each one of the layers. So we need to think about protecting the protocol, the network, and the application layer altogether. What's the worst thing that happens if somebody does get traced, though? Well, you are in a non-democratic government, and you receive some funding from a human rights organization through a cryptocurrency, and then you get to jail. I think the answer is that the, the security model of a cryptocurrency basically devolves to the normal financial system, right? Which is, I, mean, I think for, for many people, certainly not everyone, but for many people, the draw of cryptocurrencies was this different security model, this different privacy model. And if, you know, if basically a government can figure out exactly what you're doing at all times and can effectively step in the middle and say, look, you want to cash out your, I mean, ultimately all these cryptocurrencies right now, they don't really have a rich on-chain economy. If you want to use your money you need to send it through an exchange and then go get it out. Um, if, you, if a government says, hey, you know what, I'm not gonna let you cash out, then effectively your cryptocurrency is tainted and a government can stop you from uh, actually using your, your assets. So uh, the, uh, I, th I think the, the, the question there is, you know, for many people the draw of cryptocurrencies was this increase in transparency. And that's one of the really exciting ideas about Bitcoin. Um, for many other people, more from the cypherpunk side, uh, of the original people who were very attracted to the privacy and the uncensorability of these currencies, um, the, the actual privacy at the network level, at the application level, uh, that is what's required for these to have truly private characteristics that are different from the monetary system we already use. And there's, I mean, there's tokens that have emerged, Monero, Zcash, to basically provide more privacy, but are they, like, are those actually tokens that will be used? Will, like, won't governments, won't those, you know, the powers that be try to take the, to, to I don't know, kill those? <clears throat> TBD? <laughs> um, I mean, so already just, you see some activity from some governments, so I think uh, Japan recently banned all privacy currencies, so Monero and, Japan, and Zcash are, are illegal there. So far, the U.S. has been fairly open-minded, and I think Coin Center has done a lot of great work here in educating um, uh, the U.S. government on the role of these privacy currencies. And for all of these currencies as well, um, you know, there, there, are, there are many valid use cases for them that are, that are not the obvious thing in the room, which we haven't mentioned yet, which is criminality, right? Uh, you know, these don't purely have just criminal use cases. There are many reasons why one would want to keep their, their financial business uh, private, 
and anonymous. Um, so, you know, for something like Zcash, you actually can turn on and off that privacy setting. For something like Monero, all transactions on Monero are private by default, which the, there, like, like we mentioned, there are sort of different parameters to these systems that not everybody fully understands quite yet. Um, and we might see, you know, right now, for example, on, uh, for Zcash, all Zcash transactions that go to exchanges must be unshielded. So there's, there's, there's a much smaller anonymity set than it actually one, one would assume when using something like Zcash. Um, but all of, these, all of these are really evolving. They're all in the very early stages and we're trying to figure out the design space and how to evolve these protocols to be really scalable. Yeah, to, to really echo Hasib, I, I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. Uh, it's something that we even see in the traditional financial world. Uh, for example, if I give you my bank account number, you're going to learn nothing about my financial history. But if I give you my Ethereum address, you'll learn everything about my financial history. You'll, you'll learn you know, how, how much balances I have. You'll learn how often I use it. You'll learn even what dApps I may be using. There's, there's a whole slew of things that basically become available for everybody to learn about. And you know, granted, in the history of blockchain's development, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, property has been a fundamental uh, ability for everyone to validate and ensure that the records are correct. And I think that the best part about where we're headed is that there are new techniques where we can use this to uh, obfuscate some parts of this, provide privacy as a public good, and use that uh, to ensure that we can continue to, to transact trustlessly, but not, not necessarily uh, reveal all of the contents of that data. And uh, ultimately, you know, for, for everyone that is uh, using these networks and wondering, does privacy matter? I would say, first off, it does. Um, if you think about you know, something as simple as even a, a bathroom stall, you know, I think everybody values the fact that you have bathroom stalls. Uh, but, uh, and for the majority of people that use it, you know, there's no problems, we're just using it for legitimate reasons. That's not to say there aren't shady people who use bathroom stalls for nefarious reasons. But uh, you know, ultimately the Doors goal- and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> ultimately the goal is to provide uh, this basic right to people uh, in a way that makes sense and is fair. Do we think it's actually gonna happen though? I think that was my question before. So even like your Zcash example, um, Zcash has the shielded accounts that you can turn on or go into, you can put your funds in there. And I think at Zcon Zero, we learned that, I think it's like under 5% of all Zcash transactions are using like this. Like 1% or 1%, so it's shielded, like, yeah. it's, super, it's super rare that people are actually using it. So do we think it's actually like plausible? Uh, I think it's a lot of a question of defaults because, you know, in Zcash, it, but transactions are not private by default. And a lot of people do not like fully understand this. I think people starting, are starting to understand more and more, but many people still don't like, they think it's all like somewhere in their internet and nobody sees. And, and, and maybe they don't even understand why they should care because it, it, it's hard to kind of make this connection between what I'm doing with my Bitcoin or Zcash and with my like normal bank account. But if you just think of your Zcash wallet as your bank account and then you imagine that your bank account is just published on a website for everyone to see, then you would probably immediately start using private transactions. It, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. If, and of course, you're not doing anything wrong. So, so in the Zcash case, I think it's just a matter of default. And also there is like a computational cost for creating this transaction. It takes like a couple of minutes and a lot of RAM. So it's, it's difficult. So that's why people are not using that. I think in general, people care. And in the case of Zcash's example, there's a significant barrier to entry to use that privacy feature. In, uh, and that's in part why they have uh, transparent uh, as the default option currently. Um, we're talking about machines that will you know, take about a minute to compute a private transaction and to send it over. And uh, in addition, the distribution of the software uh, for uh, desktops has not been uh, wide. And so um, there has been, even in Zcash's case, significant strides made to actually make that more convenient. Uh, we see, for example, a network upgrade that will be happening at the end of this month where uh, private transactions will be using a new uh, stack where you can actually generate one in about uh, five or six seconds. And that's uh, something that even works on mobile devices. We haven't been able to see that yet. And so as these uh, barriers to entry and this friction starts to go down, I think those numbers are naturally going to go up. Um, in general, people, uh, I think, do care about privacy. I, I think um, it's easy to analogize cryptocurrencies to bank accounts. Uh, but if you look at the Bitcoin white paper, the, the way Satoshi describes Bitcoin is actually as peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And cash is actually what, when, when we talk about privacy, right? Bank accounts actually don't really have privacy. 
because ultimately your bank account is subject to audit by regulators. Uh, people, you know, the, the bank can reach into your bank account and tell you, hey, you, you, you're spending too much money on this, we're closing your account. Um, cash is one of these, it's, it's kind of a historical artifact that we even have cash. Uh, there's, this, there's this very interesting book called uh, The Curse of Cash, which basically, it, long story short, I mean, I don't agree with most of the book, but the, the kind of takeaway you get after reading this book is that if cash were invented today, um, it would not be approved by the government, right? Nobody would allow cash to exist. Um, cryptocurrencies basically try to mirror the promise of cash. And it's basically the same situation. If cash were invented today, governments would not want it, right? Um, and so it's very clear that, to my mind, uh, you, you can't be Pollyanna-ish about these things. Like, we're not going to walk in and rebuild a new financial system with totally different privacy guarantees than the one that currently exists. Because basically what it implies is a, a shift of power from governments to individuals. And you cannot take power without a fight. So there will be a fight at some point, and we haven't gotten to that point yet because ultimately these privacy technologies are still so small and nascent. And even with the potential criminality on something like Monero being used on dark markets, it's a pittance relative to just the, the fact that these currencies are all very small and they're mostly used for trading and speculation, right? Um, but eventually that will change. And when that changes, I think it will, be, it will be a process that requires a lot of citizen engagement and a lot of political engagement to actually settle the question of, are these things going to become a part of society or not? And I don't think it's something we're going to know in advance until that fight actually takes place. My personal opinion is that I think that privacy will have a more conservative adoption on the real world, like within 10 years. Um, I think that humans will always have the optionality of transferring crypto in private means. Uh, just as today, I can choose to transfer money through Bitcoin or Monero. But I think the thing that will change over, say, the next couple of years is that uh, the optionality will become more pr on the protocol level. So uh, take, for example, um, like payment networks are, become, are, are very big uh, or will be a big part of how uh, crypto is transferred um, in, by scalable means. And I think that the number one pet peeve that uh, I have with uh, the Lightning Network is that um, it's touted as making Bitcoin more private, but because Bitcoin itself is, is public, as Howard says, it, Bitcoin is like a blockchain without bathroom stalls, um, you can ultimately trace Lightning payments. And But uh, there are so many proposals um, on Bitcoin and Ethereum and a lot of uh, blockchains out there that um, improve the optionality of, uh, private, uh, of private transfer, so like blind signatures um, and and proposals that will allow for people to choose whether they want to send things privately or non-privately. But I think that for the most part, when interacting with exchanges, uh, when banks have some sort of service that accepts Bitcoin or uh, some other crypto, um, those will all, uh, I think, m will, those will most probably end up being uh, public uh, transfers of payment. Um, but you will always have like optionality to do P2P payments privately. Um, for whatever that's worth. I think uh, what will and should happen is that privacy should become part of the core protocols because all the additions, you know, as we're seeing, there are a lot of ideas on how to add privacy into existing protocols, and it's always very hard. It makes it less scalable and not 100% private. So there needs to be a way to make privacy the core part of blockchain protocols. Mimblewimble is one way to do that, and we're implementing that protocol. Maybe there will be others. Maybe somebody will find a way to implement it into Bitcoin so that privacy is not like a patch solution, but rather the core of the protocol. And I think at the end of the day, uh, users will be able to do everything in private, but again, choose to disclose their information to certain bodies. And, and it should be very hard to force them to do so. Like, like in cash, I mean, if you take an, uh, an example of cash, right, like a uh, hot dog stand, you know, they sell their stuff for cash, and then they report this cash, but the customers don't have reported that they made these transactions. So this is some, I think this is the general direction we need to be uh, heading to. So I want to take this panel in a slightly different direction. Um, one of the questions that we had, so the name of this panel is um, Privacy Hype. So... Uh, What's the most hyped privacy project? 
<laughs> Nobody wants to say Well, I, I'm running a privacy project. There is a lot of talk about Mimblewimble protocol. We are one implementation. There is another open source implementation called Grin. Uh, I think there is a lot of hype around the protocol because it was really built with privacy, you know, from the ground up. Uh, you know, that's that's what I have to say. Maybe you guys. Well, there is also a lot of. So you're you're using hype in a positive sense here. Uh, well, I, I don't feel we're overhyped, frankly. Okay. So you know, then uh, I mean, I would I would love to be more hyped. Um, what I hear a lot is also the, the privacy on smart contracts. You know, a lot of projects trying to address that because this also like Ethereum when it was built, it was probably privacy was not part of, of the regional thinking. And then anything that's going on in the smart contracts is seen by everyone. So again, there needs to be a solution. Whether those platforms find the right solution that solves the problem, I don't know. There is a lot of hype around those projects as well. Karthik, what do you think? Um, I think recently, uh, the project that I feel like has been the most hyped as of the recent months is definitely Mimblewimble. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's more relative because uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the Mimblewimble protocol was relatively like obscure. Um, and it actually has a really cool origin. So it was developed by, it was dropped anonymously into a Bitcoin IRC channel or the paper. And then it was, there was another paper that was done to explain uh, the original paper or to elucidate on it. And then the core developer of the, the project is still uh, completely anonymous. Um, so it has a really interesting origin around it. And I think that uh, over the last couple of months, there's been the more traditional um, ICO community that has come into Grin, um, which is, I think, there's like two parts uh, to the privacy hype that I, I want to kind of point out. I think that um, the growing community around these privacy projects is awesome. It's like absolutely crucial yeah. because the, the thing is that for a lot of people in privacy tech, uh, I noticed that they're kind of the, or it starts out from the original crypto anarchist community and uh, talking to a lot of those people, it's, uh, it gives them quite a headache to see a bunch of what they term quote unquote normies entering the project and, and kind of diversifying the community. Um, but I think that's a great part of it because you don't necessarily want these awesome projects with amazing sort of, um, that use amazing crypto to be uh, always kind of in the niche. Um, you want it to be in the mainstream at some point. But this, uh, on the flip side, I think that when there's a lot of hype that immediately enters uh, an ecosystem, um, there's also a lot of opportunity for misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, and with a misunderstanding, especially with privacy, that's extremely dangerous. Um, so there's certain things about um, Grin, like the community has grown tenfold, but I don't think the general understanding has grown tenfold. Um, so it's, and people kind of say that it's gonna take over Monero and you have all these like blockchain battles. Um, but I think that they're, the number one thing to understand as these communities grow is that there's still a lot of value in old privacy projects like Monero and Zcash. For example, with Grin, you can't do uh, non-interactive payments. So payments have to be interactive. There are no public addresses. Um, and that comes with its own set of uh, like different use cases. It's not like a Grin replacement. And yeah. so kind of understanding um, Mimblewimble uh, more clearly is, I think, like uh, what the next goal of the community should be. So this is this kind of goes back. We said this has come up a bunch of times. Such like education around privacy, because if that's not there, there's a lot of either mistakes that people make. Like with the Zcash, a lot of people think when they're using Zcash that they are acting in a private way, and they aren't. So that's like just a misunderstanding. But I also wonder if like I actually I wanted to continue the line of like, are there other projects that you feel are hyped or possibly overhyped? Uh, I, I don't want to speak necessarily to being under overhyped, but I can say I think there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of experimentation going on in the space. And it's one of the amazing things about crypto is that um, sort of, you know, crypto in the cryptography sense is that, you know, cryptocurrencies have become this hotbed for 
monetizing and experimenting with a lot of cryptography that normally really had almost no practical applications. And so you're seeing a lot of stuff around privacy preserving smart contracts, which is really, like it's really in the realm of a research problem, but you have projects, you know, spinning up and raising money and like doing a bunch of really cool things, which I'd love to see how they, how they pan out. Um, but I think it's also very, very early and it's very difficult to actually know, is that technology ready for you know, true privacy, scalability, you know, user adoption. Do you feel like there's a lot of promises being made right now? There are definitely a lot of promises being made. Uh, that was sort of another problem, I think, that comes along with hype. Mm -hmm. Yes. It can do everything. It exactly. can cover this, get these kids there's, there's a lot of over-promising, which, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I see almost everything in this space, maybe Bitcoin aside, as early stage experimental technology, right? Like, it hasn't really proven that it can scale to a worldwide, uh, uh, to worldwide adoption, it hasn't really proven privacy or security because ultimately, you know, security is not something you can prove in a positive sense. Security is something that you prove by not having been broken over a long enough period of time, right? Unless you're entirely composing your system out of formally verified components, which is not really possible given how complex computers are in the real world. Um, you, you know, security is just kind of a, a, an aspirational thing, right? Almost every single major project even privacy coins included, have had bugs, have had hacks, have been broken at some point in time. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, and I'd love to see one of these different approaches to uh, privacy-preserving smart contracts work out. But um, in the absence of any real uh, you know, live, scalable networks, it's hard to really know for certain whether they will pan out. What about you, Howard? Well, hyped, I overhyped? <clears throat> I think that uh, there is a general trend towards private smart contracts right now, and a lot of teams are claiming to be able to develop these types of protocols. Um, in my experience, this is one of those holy grails of the most complex cryptography um, underneath, and very few teams have the ability to really deliver on this. Um, my hope is that you know, more cryptographers start to look at this and attempt to develop privacy-preserving protocols that will achieve this decentralized computation model so that you can enable uh, private smart contracts. Um, we're starting to see a few academic groups uh, come out uh, of uh, research uh, labs to actually build companies and develop this technology. And uh, I think that even then, as an industry, we're starting to realize that this privacy tech in and of itself is actually uh, good for more than just privacy. Uh, we're actually starting to see it good for also scalability use cases and also for um, usability. And yeah. in general, that door is starting to open wide because uh, think about it this way. Uh, information theoretically, if I have less data that I need to process, because in this case it's private, um, as a network, I can actually run faster. And so people are starting to stumble on this idea that, hey, maybe you know, these compression techniques or these uh, proving techniques uh, lend themselves quite well uh, for scaling, actually. And um, this is a whole other avenue that people are starting to look towards. So you didn't, I mean, you mentioned sort of general, there are some types of research, but can you give me some examples? Sh sure. Like that are being made with just smart contracts? If we look at... Uh, the different techniques that are most common and most prevalent. Uh, you have things like uh, secure hardware. Um, you have things like zero-knowledge proofs, uh, homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation. And each of these has different guarantees, different properties, and different assumptions that are being made. Um, for uh, the most practical, I think uh, secure hardware is really right on that cusp of uh, actually making its way out, uh, but certainly not with its own controversy. Um, and if you look at things like zero-knowledge proofs, I think that this is a, a more cryptographic approach that can guarantee you uh, some of those assurances that people have concerns about in the camp of secure hardware. Um, homomorphic encryption uh, is currently rather impractical, from my view, uh, for actual uh, computational uh, feasibility reasons. Um, and uh, when it comes to multi-party computation, we certainly see some groups trying to target this. However, the scalability of uh, the number of participants in a round uh, is uh, quite capped by the uh, also the computational bandwidth. So you just mentioned hardware, but in that stack of privacy, you didn't mention hardware. Where does that live? That's like under the protocol, right? It's like around the whole thing. Yeah. And, and I guess my question is like, how does somebody actually exploit that? Like, I, I don't know if everyone understands that. Like, there is this other place where privacy could be 
Yeah, so the, the proposed techniques that use secure hardware basically are providing an enclave where you can run your computation in it. Uh, your process basically lives in this enclave, and you will run the computation in there. Uh, the enclave itself provides an attestation to say, hey, there was no tampering and no, uh, no malicious attempts uh, to modify the results uh, during this uh, program's execution. Um, we've seen uh, multiple uh, chip manufacturers and hardware vendors develop their own secure enclave technology. Um, the most prevalent recently has been uh, Intel SGX. In fact, uh, most of the uh, CPUs out there in the world and your laptops from 2015 onwards actually include SGX. Uh, the BIOS may have it turned on or off, but uh, there has been a lot of research then by security researchers to look at, hey, is this uh, hardware really tamper resistant? Is there ways to actually attack this? Maybe via side channel attacks, maybe via other mechanisms. And uh, there was a paper that was revealed uh, just a month and a half ago that showed that there is a, a proposed attack to try to extract keys from the hardware enclaves themselves in Intel SGX models. Now, that's not to say that this is a huge uh, vulnerability in that uh, it's uh, unfixable. In fact, there is going to be uh, uh, patches to this to make this uh, happen. But uh, it's, it really uh, shouts the importance of having multiple implementations, especially in a space that's all about you know, being able to uh, trustlessly transact with each other in a decentralized fashion. Because here, I mean, what ends up happening is you have to trust the manufacturers. Yeah. Then. And ultimately, I don't, uh, I don't think of it as a necess uh, necessarily a problem. Uh, currently, in the bootstrapping phase and in the experimentation phase, yes, it is. But uh, down the line, uh, once you have multiple vendors, you have multiple uh, uh, abilities to use different hardware, I, I don't see that as a fundamental issue. The reality is today, you, you also have to trust your hardware, right? Yeah. Ultimately, you're not redoing the computations that your computer is doing in your head. Uh, you're trusting that you know, Intel created a processor and it does what it's supposed to. I think that, um, at least from my perspective, <clears throat> the thing that's like the most worrisome is that there's a lot of technologies like SGX and, and, and enclaves that um, are designed and built for a specific purpose and they're being repurposed for a, a totally like different set but a really wide ranging set of promises in blockchain technology. And now I'm not like an expert in enclave technology, I, I know how they work. Um, and that's really worrisome for me because there isn't that much thought put into what exactly can you promise and like what can you use Enclave technology for. So there's like the more conservative approaches, which is uh, what, it, what it usually like is used for. So like for example, enterprise tech and stuff. Um, and then the flip side is using it for blockchains and ensuring that running your transactions or running smart contracts, contracts through SGX makes it private. But it also overlooks the fact that SGX has all these um, as, as Howard said, attack vectors, but also like core vulnerabilities just yeah. in terms of SGX work. So the, the core, like de what defines your enclave is its setup and your S setup is trusted um, to a service that provides this. And um, for Intel specifically, Intel holds a set of EPID keys, um, which uh, can, which you have to, so you call on Intel's API and Intel has these EPID keys and generates a separate key for you that you can then use to attest for any computation that is uh, run through your enclave. Um, but that entire process, um, having an entire blockchain run on it, is a huge vulnerability for that entire blockchain if that EPID key that Intel um, has is uh, compromised. You know, compromised. Um, and there are like, and even though it's not compromised, like there have already been rumors that it is compromised and that percolates down to is this blockchain safe at all? Um, and so that's, it's just kind of worrisome that a lot of these technologies are just blindly applied to, to blockchain tech. Now I'm not saying that they can't be applied or they shouldn't be applied, um, but there just needs to be for like new tech that kind of comes out of the traditional crypto realm or traditional tech realm. Um, there needs to be like an extra level of scrutiny before applying it to transacting with real volumes of money. To, to add on to Karthik's point, uh, I think that SGX and these secure enclave technologies are good base layer foundation, but it's not the end all to it. You should, you should use technologies like this if you want certain types of assurances, but in addition, uh, it, 
it, you should also use cryptographic uh, protocols on top of that that can help to provide even better guarantees, things that are more information theoretically uh, uh, secure and things that uh, provide more assurances about the actual computation at hand, not just the assurance that you know, the, the program itself was not uh, uh, manipulated uh, in the process. And uh, that's more about having layers. That's more about having multiple degrees of security, not just having you know, one, one uh, holy grail fix and that's it. So one other, um, we were talking about this earlier, but like a possible problem with some privacy tech is, say you have, we're gonna use, <laughs> I hope Zcash won't mind me using them, but say you have a, a Zcash, you're using, um, sorry, say you find that there's a vulnerability that allows you to mine Zcash in a shielded account, in a shielded way, um, or no, what is it? You forge Zcash, I think, in the shielded accounts. I think that's the, the terminology. Because it's shielded, it wouldn't necessarily be recognized as happening. So if in the private part of it, something has gone wrong, um, you can't find it out. Is this a problem? Is this like a... Well, it, it, is, it is definitely a problem. So the protocol has to have a very clear proof that this doesn't happen. Right, so let's say in Mimblewimble, the Coinbase transactions, the mining transactions are all visible. And, and then anything else that happens just has to sum up to zero. And there is very strong zero knowledge proof to, to that. And uh, this way there is like a guarantee that no money is printed from thin air. Yeah, I would say first off the layers approach also helps to give better assurances. but. Uh, in general, this is a demonstration that the team that is really building these protocols needs to uh, know what they're doing. Um, it's not enough to just have you know, an engineering team that is very excited about this, but they also should be consulting cryptographers. They should also be consulting experts who understand the trade-offs that are being made in these design choices, and in addition, uh, have multiple audits uh, done on the protocol itself after the software has been written. Uh, after all, we are humans, we make mistakes, and uh, in, in the long run, these protocols need to have uh, the right development track to ensure that when it gets out there, we don't have these problems present themselves in production. Yeah, and P.S., I actually really like the Zcash crew, and I think they're super smart. I'm not suggesting this is happening, but it is, like, it was actually just kind of, it came up as a possibility, and it, it just sort of dawned on me that yeah. activity within these shielded spaces can't be tracked as well. That also includes exploitation of vulnerabilities. So there is a very interesting vulnerability in Monero, like, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and basically what it allowed you to do was, and this is, so this was not exploited and this was patched and disclosed, um, but what it allowed you to do was for an attacker to use a random, a random public private key um, and burn an exchange's, exchange wallet's funds by sending it to the same stealth public address that was associated with that private key um, indefinitely. Um, and so you can, so if an attacker were to exploit this, like he wouldn't control those funds, but he could burn any wallet on, like any Monero wallet. Um, and that is actually extremely difficult to track because, you know, like first of all, no one actually owns that, it's just being burnt. Um, and there's no reward, but I guess if you don't like an exchange or you want to take it down, then I guess that's your reward. Um, so I guess like that concern is actually very real. Um, and especially in the private pay, spa like space, I would like maybe not for like Mimblewimble and like for minting tokens, like there's strong guarantees around that. Um, but especially for like stealing funds or burning funds, like the Monero case, um, that's a pretty big worry. If uh, on the bright side, if Zcash does have an inflation bug, maybe it could become the next Bitcoin. No, no one catches that. I didn't get there it. There was a big inflation bug in Bitcoin. That's the joke. Yeah. Sorry, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we're, just, we're just about to wrap up. Uh, I want to, so we kind of landed on a, a, like a darker note here, but I want to ask, are you guys hopeful for privacy tech, for privacy blockchain tech? Absolutely. Uh, real quickly, I think privacy tech is not only great for privacy, it's great for scalability and usability. We're starting to see this technology uh, being used to try to address a, a more scalable storage approach, to have more scalable compute, to have a more usable uh, a, a, like clients. Uh, the, the technology itself is just starting to uh, manifest uh, in our industry, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where the experiments go. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, I actually see that generally like privacy tech is diversifying and that people are getting more creative with their proposals. 
Um, so there are alternatives to things that have been traditionally very computationally intensive um, or things that have trusted setups. And so there's just a lot more choices to pick from right now. And protocols are also moving to update themselves and include better uh, support for uh, future privacy tech. So, um, you know, Ethereum uh, is going to have better privacy guarantees at some point. Uh, Bitcoin will have Schnorr signatures and that allow things like private payment channels and blind signatures to become a thing. Uh, and Monero and Zcash are also moving forward the uh, the the, bear, the threshold of uh, of privacy. So. I think that generally, um, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty bullish on, um, but we'll see over the next couple of years. Yeah, I agree. Of course, I'm very bullish on privacy, and in my view, you know, electronic money or any money cannot really be used at scale. You know, cannot be widely adopted if it doesn't allow a certain level of privacy, because it is not really possible to do any kind of business if all your transactions are visible uh, and it needs to be the default setting on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the private currencies needs to learn to play ball with regulation because we don't really want them to become private and be like uh, pariah in the, um, in the financial world like Monero and Zcash unfortunately are today, like if you use Monero and try to convert this to fiat, it's like good luck with that in a bank, it's very hard. Uh, so the way the industry, and I think it's, it's where the, the industry is going, is providing privacy and trying to play ball with uh, with certain extent. And this will, will also eventually bend the regulations a little bit because it will all converge just to a better world where people can use crypto more and more but still live in the kind of compliance space to a large extent. Cool, I think that concludes privacy hype. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me on this stage. Thank you guys for watching this panel. Cheers. Thanks, Anna. Thank you.